I believe I have a really uh, fresh word, and I was so intimidated when God began to speak to me about this um, uh, before things happened um, earlier in the week, last week, with our capital. And then um, afterwards, uh, I am even more intimidated, but I see the hand of God as he began to speak, and I'm honored that he would choose to entrust me to share um, from his heart and a little bit of mine, too. So um, can anybody relate that 2020 was unlike any year we have seen thus far? I really, I really feel like that, and um, a lot of different events have transpired, and um, in the last year, if I'm honest, it's really kind of gotten me off kilter because my normal everyday routine and just what the way I go about life uh, has a bit, a, been a bit challenged, and um, I struggle with that personally. And so inside my own mind and in my own heart, um, I struggled just personally. I struggled in my relationship with God. I've just struggled, and I know that I'm not alone. I have a really close-knit f- friend group, and we all have felt it in one way or another, and I'm so thankful for those friends that we can just talk about it, vent, and then we pray, and then we move on and better. And so if you don't have those type of people in your lives, you need to find yourself some good friends. But um, I struggled. I struggled. At times I feel like I've lacked faith during the course of 2020. Um, sometimes I had disbelief. I battled disbelief. Sometimes I battled even trusting in God, trusting in myself, the things I've overcome through the grace of God. And uh, I've really been too focused on the circumstances. Can anybody else relate to that? I've been too focused on how my life has changed, how life at the church has changed, life at my job, just life, how it's changed. And I get so wrapped up in that that I forget to keep my eyes fixed on God. And so, um, though I know the steps to take in order to protect myself from those snares, I still just do it on my own. You know, I because I know better. You know, okay, maybe I know better. Okay, I know that I can do it on my own. So I just don't need those steps. Is what I try to tell myself in my mind. And uh, a couple of uh, when we had connect group, I shared about that. How sometimes I just think I know best, and they all just kind of stared at me, and it was like crickets in my connect group. <laughs> but at the same time, then they're like, afterwards, they're like, yeah, like I do that too. I'm like, oh, you just left me hanging in the middle of connect group. It's okay. No, but they're really encouraging, and they uh, were praying for me um, to overcome that, and um, I have been putting into practice some tools I've been learning to not do that. But since I try to do it on my own, and then I just try to take God like he has, you know, I can pick him up by the coat and just kind of shove him into the parts of my life and my things that I think are okay, where he fits, just to make me feel better. You know, that's not the way to do that. And I feel like that's a really good thing to confess because I'm so guilty of that. So guilty of me being the first line of offense, defense, whatever, instead of looking to God. And I, then I try to shove God after I've already in the way and created a nice little cavern that I'm stuck in. And I'm trying to pull, put him into those things. And so I'm thankful that God has brought about this revelation because it means that he has a plan. And I know his plans often require us to have steps to take. And so I'm going to talk today about going back to Bethel. There's steps to go back into his plan and into his perfect presence. Amen. We need more of that in our lives. So um, I really believe that God's calling us back to Bethel. Um, Our passage is in Genesis 35, 1 through 7 where God called Jacob back to Bethel, back to where God and Jacob had a great encounter. So let's read the passage. Bear with me. It's a bit much. But then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you, purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who have answered me in the days of my distress, who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods. They had the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. 
Then he set out, and the terror of God fell on all the towns all around them, so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people later came to Luz, which is Bethel, and the land of Canaan, and there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel. It is because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. I think there's times in our lives where we're going to have to stop and just consider and maybe reconsider our relationship with Christ. We find that we may need to recommit, rededicate, and really return to the Lord. And I'm not talking just in action, but I'm talking about a heart switch in our lives. Life is not what we once knew. It's changed. And when change comes, often we fix our eyes on the change instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus to help us get through the change. Can I get an amen? A lot of us do that. I'm just as guilty. One thing about this message is I'm preaching right from where I'm at. So I'm just real and raw, and uh, I'm not afraid to say I'm in the trenches and uh, logging through it with you guys. So um, I have a lot of personal reflections plus with the Word of God. But we tend to do things the way we want or the way we see and think that it should go. But as Christians, we're not called to do that. We're called to fix our eyes on the Lord and to trust in the fact that God has ordered our steps from day one. But we have to seek him out to see what those are. We are not the all-knowing beings, right? God is the all-knowing. But the Lord has been so kind and gracious to remind us that our ways are not his ways. If you think about the great albatross that flies across the world several times in its lifetime, it faces great gale force winds and for days at times, but it still has to stay the course because it has its routine and it has its place in order to take care of things. And um, so it has to stay the course so you know it can't like, you know, just change it up and like hitch a ride on a boat, like just because it's like convenient or the storm's just a little bit too much. Because a fun fact that I discovered while researching for this, um, they actually get seasick. They can't handle being down. And so they don't have the luxury of changing up their course. They have to stay in the vein that they're in. Or they lose their sense of direction and become seasick. I battle motion sickness, I understand. Changing it up, have to stay right where I need to be. But you know, as Christians and even people in general, when we face our own share of gale force winds in our lifetime, we manage it just fine. Most of the times, we can manage it while remembering that we are in this world, but we're not of this world. Most of the time, we manage it. You see, because if we try to become in the world, we lose momentum and we lose joy, much like the albatross, if they land on a random boat to catch a ride, they can't handle that and they lose their sense of direction. We do that too when we take our eyes off the Lord. And I know it's kind of a crazy analogy. I saw some faces kind of like, huh? But it's the closest thing that I could get to like kind of prove my point with like actual facts. So that's what I use. And I really feel like this is a timely message because many of us have lost our heading. Some of us have stayed in the vein. Some of us are doing just fine through this whole thing and and are not really affected by what's going on maybe in government or um, even in jobs or just anything. Um, I don't know very many people who are that way, and props to you for keeping the faith. But we have been hit by some gale force winds. And we have to find a way to keep our heading so that we don't find ourselves in peril on the sea of life. So God's calling us back to Bethel. And going back, there's some steps we need to take. So just before the passage in Genesis 35, in chapter 34, we learn that Jacob and his family were once again in trouble because of their actions, and fear had set in. Can anybody relate? Fear had set in. Steps had been taken. Maybe it wasn't us that took the steps, but our nation has taken steps, and now fear has set in. And much like Jacob... He knew he had to turn to God to help them. Like Tara charged us, church, we have to turn to God in order to help us. He is the only answer. 
He is the only way that we're going to get through this. So just as Jacob and his family were called back to Bethel, they had to take steps that Jacob knew were necessary to get back to Bethel. And the first step was to return to the altar. And I don't think you heard me. Return back to the altar. Get back to the place where we can encounter God's presence. And it's not necessarily an altar like up here. That's awesome. But I'm talking about an altar in our hearts. Turn back to the altar in our hearts that God, go back to the place in our hearts where God once met us. So we turn to the altar of prayer, where a place where we hunger and thirst after God. There's something about praying, that's for sure. There's something about praying about everything so that we worry about nothing. And there's something about praying without ceasing Church, that's what we're called to do. We are called to pray about everything and worry about nothing. We are called to pray without ceasing. That means we don't just pray when we find it convenient or when we're feeling like our world's crashing in. That's important to pray through that too. But I'm talking about day in and day out, seeking the Lord's face for your day, for your direction, for your encounters. We have to get back to that. Can we remember a time in our place a time or a place in our lives where this happened? I feel like I have to kind of go way back into my preteen years when I first encountered the Lord and all of a sudden I had this hope. I was 12 years old at Buell First Assembly and I had this hope that began to rise up in me and a sense of peace came over me. At the time, my family wasn't serving the Lord, but I knew that God had called me. I knew that God wanted me to be saved. And that peace that I felt when I submitted and surrendered and asked Christ to come into my heart, that's what we're talking about. That moment right there where the peace of God that passes all understanding began to wash over you, where the presence of God was noticeable in our lives. Not the circumstances that were going on in our lives, but the presence of God was the thing that was noticeable. Y'all, I can't relate right now. I can't, I can't relate. There's glimpses, but I'm so stuck in the things going on that I can't see and sometimes even feel the presence of God. But what do we know? It's still there, whether we can see it or we can feel it. The presence of God is still there. So we need to return to the altar of prayer. I really believe we need to return to the altar of praise. You see, the more we praise God, the bigger he gets in our lives. But we also know that God is sovereign, so really nothing is bigger than him. But in our lives, we often make things bigger than Christ. We need to go back to the adoration and the appreciation for all that God has done. So it's important to get back to praise. That's the type of praise I'm talking about, the type of praise that edifies the glory and the grace of God and the giftings of our Christ. Doesn't edify what I can do. Doesn't praise what somebody else can do. It's what God can do. Get back to adding that as a daily part of our lives. Second by second, if needed, whatever it takes for us to get through, we have to get back to that. The next thing is to return to the altar of power. We need to get hungry for the power of the Holy Spirit again in our lives. I don't know about you, but I miss having that power activated in my soul where I find myself fearless. I find myself fearless and completely led by the Holy Spirit that when somebody crosses my path and there's a pricking in my heart to speak to them. And I'm like, no, I can't do that. I'm at work. No, I have a shopping list to take care of, or I'm on my way to do this, I'm on my way to do that. But putting God's agenda above my own and choosing to be led by the Holy Spirit, we need to get back to the power of the Holy Spirit. We are called to make disciples of all nations. How can we do that in our own strength? People are crazy scary. (laughs) I'm just being real. Some of them are terrifying. It's really scary. And in my experience with going out and just living Christ out loud in front of people, there will be people that come against you because they are yet to know or they think they know better because their experience has been something different. 
I don't like facing that alone. I need the power of the Holy Spirit with me because, y'all, I'm a spitfire with my words and my attitude. I need the grace of God to bring some taming to my heart and to be led by his utterance. We're called to make disciples of all nations. How can we do that without the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us? We need to get rid of the things and the people that have taken the place of the Holy Spirit's power in our lives. And this one hits right at my heart. I mean, uh, when I was praying over this for about one of the days, I was back working in the iron room on my message, and I just began to weep for like a half hour, just crying out to the Lord because I was like, Lord, this is painful. I have let so many things and so many people come in the place that's made for you. I feel as if I've literally shoved some things or, sorry, some of you people into that hole that's supposed to be for the Holy Spirit's power, and I begin to draw power from those people or those things. And that sucks people dry because they're not meant to fulfill that in our lives. It's made for the Holy Spirit to infill us and have that power. When we shove people or things into that Holy Spirit hole, it leaves no room for the Holy Spirit to begin to lead us and guide us. I know, I can see it all around you that you resonate with that. We're all guilty of this. We need to get back to the altar of power where we can stay connected. In my um, Bible classes, I read about a missionary named Dr. Herbert Jackson. Dr. Jackson was assigned a car for the mission field through Speed the Light. But the car wouldn't start without a push. I'm not a car girl. I don't know what that means. Sounds very hard, judging by the rest of the story, but it literally wouldn't start without a push. So he would have to have students from the school help him push it when he'd go to the school. And around town, he would need to park up a hill or leave it running. Sounds sucky. (laughs) Doesn't sound like it's fun. So it continued this for two years. That's a long two years. Being a missionary dependent on a car that you have to push start. I don't, no thanks. So over the course of the two years, Dr. Jackson's health began to decline, and they were going to have to leave the area. So a new missionary had been assigned to the area. Dr. Jackson was explaining the car situation to the new missionary, and as they were talking, the new missionary began to look around under the hood. And after a short time, the new missionary chuckled and interrupted Dr. Jackson, and he said, Dr. Jackson, I believe the problem is just a loose cable. The new missionary climbed behind the wheel of the car, started it up, and it roared to life. For two years, there had been needless trouble, and it became a routine. The power was there the whole time. The issue was a loose connection that kept Dr. Jackson from the power he needed to go about his routine. I love that story. When I was reading it, I was like, yeah, I can relate to loose connection and all of a sudden somebody coming along and praying for me or maybe it was a sermon or maybe just in reading the word of God where I was like, oh, the, it's been adjusted and all of a sudden, boom, there we go. Or I had to make the adjustment or whatever it is, all of a sudden you had power that you didn't realize was gone because you came so used to doing stuff a certain way, right? So um, I feel like that's really, really uh, a cool thing to just realize. So um, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 through 21, we're going to see what type of power that I'm talking about. It says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority, and power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. That's the type of power that I'm talking about, the type of power that we have access through the Holy Spirit because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. That's the type of power that we need in our lives. I feel like that's the type of power we're going to need to rely on to direct our steps as a nation. That's the only thing that's going to overcome the principalities of the darkness. Before we can start the journey to go back to Bethel, 
we need to do some work to prepare ourselves for Bethel. Remember what Jacob was told, told his family before the journey to Bethel? Let's look at Genesis chapter 35, verse 2. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away foreign gods that are among you, purify yourself, and change your garments. And I feel like Jacob knew how to please the Lord. And I feel as Christians, we also know how to please the Lord. We know how to do it. Because you see, God can't be where sin is. We must purify ourselves before the Lord. If I find that the presence of God is missing in my life, what is it in me that is causing that separation because it's there, ready and waiting for me to grab? What is it in me that's keeping me from the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life? What is it as a nation that's keeping the presence of God in our, in our nation? What is it about us? We need to put away foreign gods. Idols is another word for foreign gods. We need to get rid of the things and the people that took our eyes off the Lord. Y'all, we need to get rid of the things and the people that took the place that are stealing our gaze from the Lord. Okay, that's important step. Once again, we shove people and things in the place that don't belong in our lives. All of a sudden, these people and these things have influence over our lives. And we're the ones left in a little bit of a spin out, wondering what happened, what went wrong, where. We can no longer let anything or anyone come between us and God. As a nation, we can no longer let anything come between us and God. We have to do that for ourselves so that we can stand as a unified front as a nation. We have to get right ourselves. A purification needs to happen. We know about the purification process. It can happen a couple of different ways, but sometimes it involves heat, purifying some imperfections out of us. Sounds painful. But at the same time, some of those things that I begin to adorn myself with, some of those people, those things that I put into place, that was painful to do it, but I was willing because it's what I wanted. It's going to be painful to remove those things. How many of you know we have the power of the Holy Spirit and the healing of the Holy Spirit to come in and patch those wounds and patch those holes and make the structure back to a Holy Spirit-shaped hole in our lives? We need to get rid of the sin that so easily entangles us. I know about you, but there's some things in, this, in my life that trip me up. There's some things that I've allowed myself an allotment because it's okay for a moment or because I didn't know better, and now God has convicted me of it, yet I still choose to participate or whatever it is, and that God has called it sin. All of these acts are designed to show a repentant heart. That's what God is looking for. When we go back to Bethel, he's looking for our hearts to be repentant, I want to get to back to a place where my heart is repentant always for every little thing because sin is inevitable. But the grace of God is sufficient enough for me. I want to get back to a place where my heart is completely repentant toward the Lord so that he will once again turn his face to, my, to our land and we can begin to feel him and see him moving in mighty ways. But right now all we see is our circumstances and what's going on. Some of us need to cast off the weights that drag us down. Some of us, for some of us, the weights are in our minds. Come on, I battle in my mind greatly. I talk to myself a lot up here. Boy, if anybody ever heard what was going on, <clears throat> that'd be an adventure and maybe a couple of books or seven, you know, whatever. Some of us have people in our lives that are weights. And some of us have the weights of ungodly lifestyle? Are there, is there people in our life that God has convicted us about having in our lives? And I'm not talking about going out and, and, and being a light into the world. That's what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is allowing these people 
that don't have a godly lifestyle have influence in our lives, and we are, should be the ones to influence them. But oftentimes, that's not what happens. I had a dear friend growing up all the time. She would tell me, Krista, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. All the time, she would tell me that, remind me that. The time growing up, my family wasn't saved, and I would struggle, so then I would talk to her about it, and she would pray with me, and before I would go, she'd give me a hug, and she would say, Krista, remember, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. There's a peace and there's an empowerment that comes when we can begin to understand that. We need to uh, be like the, like the Apostle Paul charges, we need to renew our minds and think on good things. These weights, the weights themselves aren't sin, but if they're left unattended, they will turn into sin. As sure as you and I know, they will turn to sin. They cannot be neglected. And I just, it's been my prayer that the Holy Spirit begin to speak to me and to all of us about the things in our life that are holding us down, that are blocking us from being able to go back into the, go back to Bethel. I don't want to be dragging these weights around. I don't want to be tripped up by the snares of the things of the world. The world tries to justify sin and call it something else or to tone down the awfulness of sin. According to Herschel Hobb, who wrote The Fundamentals of Our Faith, he says, psychology calls sin maladjustment. Biology labels it a disease. Ethics suggests it's a moral lapse. Philosophy regards it as a stumbling in the upward progress of the human race. But we as Christians know the Bible calls sin what it is. Sin. Another area we need to work on our life while we're preparing to go back to Bethel is listening for the voice of God. For me, there are many times I don't want to listen, nor do I want to do the work that it takes to listen. I think oftentimes in order to really listen for the voice of God, Sometimes it means waiting. Oh, sometimes that's not fun. We need to wait upon the Lord. He speaks in so many ways through prayer, through other people, and through his word. So much so that his word is not only a roadmap to righteousness, but it can serve as a warning sign to life. Has anybody ever heard the voice of God while reading his word? I know that we can relate to that. So I want to challenge us to read our Bible and to work on developing an intimate relationship with Jesus through his word so that when we read his word, it, he speaks to us. We can override our minds and override everything that we know and allow him to speak to us through his word. James 1, 21 and 22 says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the words and not only hearers deceiving yourself. If, you are just, if we are just coming to church and hearing the word of the Lord, or we're just listening to the little voice talking to us that reads the Bible to us, and we're not being doers of the word, we need to take it a step further and start to be active Christians instead of passive Christians. Because where we're going, we're going to need to have all the active Christians we have possible in order to stand. We're going to need every ounce of activation that can come from the Holy Spirit and from the Word of God. I think with all the crazy in the world, I truly believe we can use the Lord's encouragement more than ever. The second point to listen for is the Lord's encouragement. And sometimes it can come from His Word, His prophecy, or through somebody's testimony. Can anybody do with more encouragement? I love all the people in my life. I make it a point to have people in my life who are capable of edifying me and building me up instead of tearing me down or sucking the life out of me. I try to do that for other people. I try to be that type of person, but I can't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit. But I try to be the person of encouragement. How many of you know, as great as my friends are and as great as the people who love me dearly and their encouragement, greater is the encouragement of the Lord. 
His, there's nothing like the word of God bringing such an encouragement. With that comes an empowerment. With that comes action and moving on the behalf of God. We need to listen for the voice of God and we need to listen for his direction. That's the next step. And I, I got to chuckle at this point because if you know me, you know that I'm directly challenged in more ways than one. Okay? Like learning something new. I can pick it up really quick, like the basics really quick. But then if there needs to be a sequence about it and I didn't write it down, all hope is lost. I have no idea which direction to go first other than turn on the power button. It really just kind of becomes like a jumbled mess in my brain and then I'm like trying to pinpoint what the next step is. It works great for my job. We have new procedures all the time and I'm like, what was that? Oh wait, this isn't working because I'm using the procedure from before. That's okay. That's fine. But now if we're talking about getting directions to a place, like following those directions um, or giving directions, um, I truly couldn't find my way out of a paper bag. And I mean, if you and I are in a jungle together, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm really sorry. I'm not the girl to get lost with on an on a, in the open area or closed area, whatever. No, it's a bad deal. You better have GPS or call on the Holy Spirit to help you because uh, I'm not going to be of any service. But if we're talking about taking direction from somebody, yeah, no, I still really struggle in this regard also. I constantly override my own self and I constantly override the black and white directions or even God in a sense because I think that I know best. Somebody can try and tell me something. I mean, I wasn't that bad of a disobedient child, but uh, I, if I thought I was right, I was going to let you know even though I was wrong. <laughs> I'm still that way in my adult life. God bless my husband. He's so kind to endure. <laughs> I desperately want God to give me direction in my life, but sometimes I have to shut my own self up long enough to hear the voice of God and hear his direction. And then once I hear it, to be a doer of those directions and not be like, but God, don't you think it would work better this way? Don't you think it would? I do that all the time, and I'm sure he's just up there, like, twirling his hair or whatever, waiting for me to get, it, get on with it. I really struggle to trust um, his ways, and I truly struggle in the waiting. But I think that we truly need to get out of the way and get back to where we are desperate to know where God wants to take our lives what he wants us to say, how he wants us to make decisions for our lives. You see, God is constantly speaking to us, constantly, constantly speaking to us, and it's us who can't hear because of whatever we have going on in our lives. And I believe that he is constantly speaking to our leaders who are leading our nation. He's constantly speaking to them. But when the pressure gets turned on, and the other voices get louder, what happens? The voice of truth, all of a sudden we can't hear it. He's still speaking the same volume, speaking in the same manner that we can understand. It's us. And I believe that's one of our downfalls as a nation is we no longer can hear the voice of God because we either we ourselves have both constantly overrode it or we're just choosing not to listen. Or maybe it's because people don't know to listen to the voice of God, whatever it is. But there needs to be a change in ourselves and so that we can be the change in our nation so that we can once again hear the voice of God for our leading. While researching for this message, I came across this story about listening from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. President Franklin Roosevelt got tired of smiling at that big smile and saying all the usual things at the White House receptions. So one evening, he decided to find out whether anybody was paying attention to what he was really saying. As each person came up to him with extended hand, he flashed that big smile and said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. People would automatically respond with comments such as, how lovely, 
or just keep doing that great work. Nobody really listened to what he was saying, except one foreign diplomat. When, pre when the president said, I murdered my grandmother this morning, the diplomat re responded softly, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> Thought that was a great story. Who can relate? I can be, I'm so that person that doesn't listen to a word that's coming out of somebody's mouth sometimes. I'm like, that's awesome. I'm sorry, you what? <laughs> Your grandmother what? So many times we're not actively listening. We're not hearing, therefore we can't be doing what the instructions are that come. And I love that story. I just laughed for about 10 minutes in the office, so much so that they're like, what is going on in there? Because I can relate to the saying some funny stuff because you know, I know people aren't listening um, or to be the one that didn't even catch the funny stuff but because I just was like, oh yeah, be quiet. That's a great, good, good on ya. <laughs> There's so many of us that need to get back to Bethel, back to what truly works. You know, for me, I can't even recognize what works anymore because I've been trying to do stuff on my own for so long, and I feel like as a nation, we can't recognize what works anymore because we have so many different ideas and veins instead of follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I know that seems kind of lofty, but we can do our part. But we first have to have an alignment with the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can lead by example. Because leaders hold influence. And you may think, hey, I just work at a lowly bank in Buell, Idaho. But I can still stand for something so that I don't fall for everything that's coming down the line. We need to get back to a place where God can speak to our hearts and that we can hear him. We need to go back to a place where we can let God know once more that he can count on us. He can count on us to stop listening to other voices, stop putting people and things in the place that belong to the Holy Spirit and stop trying to figure it out on our own and being impulsive and making decisions without first seeking the Lord, being impulsive and opening our mouths without first seeking the Lord and to put a time limit on the things that we're praying about because we're the ones getting weary. We need to pray without ceasing and pray hearts, God's heart for us and for our lives and for our nation. God told Jacob to go back to Bethel and to dwell there. To dwell, what does it mean to dwell? It means to take up residence, to build your home, take ownership. We need to go back to that place where we first encountered the love of God, where we first could hear the voice so clearly of the Lord that we were so excited and couldn't shut up about it, even if we didn't understand everything that was coming out of our mouth because the joy of the Lord was overcome us. We need to do some preparation to go back. Bethel represents the place where we can talk to God and he can talk to us. You see, I really truly believe that God is longing for us to return. He's longing for our close attention for that close relationship where we can walk hand in hand with him through life. I really believe that we desperately, desperately need that communication with God again. We desperately need for our nation to have communication with God again, but we desperately need it for our lives here, desperately need it for our church here, for our community. We need communication with the Lord. We need to be led by his Holy Spirit. Let every idea that comes, come from God through us as we share and speak it. I believe we all have experiences and knowledge in areas but if we're not a united front and just going off because, oh, so-and-so thinks this way and so-and-so thinks this way, so we're like, eh, eh, 
you know, constantly trying to navigate it instead of seeking the Lord. And I really believe as a church that we need to get back to seeking the Lord, make an altar, but before we can go back, there's some things we need to address in our lives. There's those foreign idols, those foreign gods, those things that have taken place of God in our lives. There's some things that we've adorned ourselves with because we're so used to it. Maybe it's because it's the way it's always been. That's what you taught, that's what you were taught. That's how you grew up. Doesn't mean that it's okay in the eyes of the Lord though. Maybe we have some weights that we're dragging around and we're doing our best, but we're dragging these weights around. If we looked behind us, we'd see deep trenches in the, in the ground behind us because we're dragging things through our lives that we weren't meant to do. We have some work to do, church, in ourselves so that we can be leaders by example and watch the, God, the Lord shine his face upon us in our land again and he can return back to it. We desperately need for God to move in our nation. We desperately need that. However, how can we be the ones to execute that if we are the ones who aren't willing to do the work to get right with the Lord, to go back to Bethel. I wanna close with this last story. Jed Harris is a producer of many plays, including Our Town. Mr. Harris became convinced that he was losing his hearing. He went to a specialist who gave him a thorough checkup. The doctor pulled out a gold watch and asked, can you hear this ticking? Mr. Harris said, of course. The specialist walked to the door and held up the watch again said, now can you hear it? Mr. Harris concentrated and said, yes, I can hear it clearly. The doctor then walked out the door to the next room and said, can you hear it now? Mr. Harris said, yes. And the doctor came back into the room shaking his head and said, Mr. Harris, there's nothing wrong with your hearing, you just don't listen. Many times, we just aren't willing to do the work to listen. Many times, we're not willing to do the work to change because it's not easy. It's not easy overcoming the things that we've struggled for so long with, overcoming the things that have just been a part of normal life. It's not easy cutting people out of our lives because the backlash is real and it's not easy creating new habits or new lifestyles. But I gotta tell you, God is calling us to do those things. God is calling us to look at our lives and to address the things that no longer bring edification to us and no longer centered around Christ so that we can go back to the place where the presence of God is so tangible, where we can have clear communication from the Lord and where we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to create disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have to go back to those things. So let's go back. Let's go back to Bethel. I think it's time we need to start to listen to what God is saying. It's time to take the necessary steps to go back and get back in the sink with the Lord.